Senator Munson. Uh, would the Honourable Senator take a question? Certainly, Senator Munson. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your passionate uh, speech. Uh, I, I certainly share some of your, your concerns. Um, like 2014, uh, some of us are having difficulty dealing with uh, the sensitive issue. Puts me in a bit of a quandary because I really believe in the, the concept of, of dying with dignity and uh, what has taken place thus far for those who have died with dignity. But I also believe in living with dignity for those who are disabled. So I'm in a bit of a quandary. And uh, I've been listening to many uh, learned speeches here today, and we'll hear a lot more. Uh, but the question I have for you, um, you did say what you thought the government should do in terms of palliative care, and more programs, and so on. But we are the upper chamber, and it will get to amendment time, and amendments will go to the, to the other side. The bill will probably be amended. It certainly sounds that way, and it gets there. And the last time it got there, the amendment was defeated, and we acquiesced as the upper chamber to what took place in the, the other, other place. How far do you think um, this chamber should go in terms of exercising its duty? It's doing its duty right now in terms of listening to everybody, everybody speaking, witnesses, 80-odd groups and organizations. But at what point, who do you think has, still has the final say, this body or the elected body? Senator Platt. First of all, uh, Senator Munson, let me, uh, let me uh, concur with the statement about we need to find a way of making sure people live with dignity. That should be our first concern. Uh, that, however, isn't the question you're asked, but I want to, I want to reiterate that. Um, palliative care should be an option. My dad got palliative care, great palliative care. Um, how far should we go? We should amend where we see flaws. We had 81 witnesses, Senator Munson. I don't think we had one that said this bill was good. That included the, the, the Minister of Disabilities. Um, now, certainly Minister Lametti and, and had to, and I'm not sure if they were part of the 81. If they were, well, they of course supported the bill. But out of the rest, nobody supported this bill. Uh, and it was a range of witnesses. So we will have amendments, and I, I think the Chamber has a pretty good idea where, where I would be wanting to bring forward amendments. Uh, I believe we have a duty as well to, to Canadians. Canadians are telling us this is a flawed bill. I think first and foremost, I always have believed that, Senator Munson, that first and foremost it's our duty if we see flaws in legislation to try to amend it as opposed to try to... Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> Darling? <laughs> Senator Clint, carry on, please. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Uh, we, we, should, we should amend legislation. We should try to improve legislation. I've always believed that. Our, our first and foremost objective should not, I think, just simply vote against. I would like to. Uh, you said we acquiesced uh, the last time. I didn't. Uh, I think I voted against it right to the end, but of course I can stand on my soapbox and say that because I was in the opposition then and I'm on, in the opposition now. Uh, Senator Munson, uh, I don't think this bill can be fixed in such a way that I will vote in favor of it uh, when it comes to three. I really don't believe that, but I shouldn't judge that. Uh, I will vote in favor of certain amendments. Uh, but I believe that we have a duty to Canadians. This is not a money bill. This is not a bill where the government will fall. And if they bring us a bill that is as deeply flawed as what, what we have heard from these witnesses, and our committee will do another, the committee will have their meetings again. They will hear more witnesses, and they will come to us with a report. But, but I heard members on the committee say that we shouldn't even, we, sh we, we shouldn't move this bill any further. We should kill it now. 
I'm not sure that I support that, but I do support the amendment. So it's a question, Senator, that I ask myself every day. I'm not an elected senator, I'm an appointed senator. So how far should we go? I believe on a life and death, on a life and death situation, Senator Munson, I believe we should go all the way. Senator Munson. Thank you for that. You were in a real good train of thought just before that minor interruption, wherever that came from but there's somebody's darling somewhere. Um, but you were there, and, and, you, and, and you did answer the question and answered it well. I, I, uh, you talked about life and death, and uh, this bill is dealing with just that, and there has been a deadline, and that'll be delayed, and we won't be dealing with uh, this uh, in terms of the, the committee and voting on this until the middle of February. We know that. Um, but I, when we talk about life and death, uh, it's real and it's happening every day. Uh, so with this bill in its process and as it's being taken along, some people may be saying dragged out, but we're doing our duty. Is it right for us though, with the amendments that went there and if it went to the other side and came back and thus ping pong began, which I haven't seen in the Senate since I've been here 17 years, is that doing our duty if we move it back and forth uh, between the, the House and uh, this chamber? Uh, we, we, I think we sent it back once last time, if I recall correctly, and then it came back again, and then we, uh, we uh, gave in at that point. Uh, so um, uh, so I, I think there is certainly precedence that we have sent it back. I'm sure before your time and mine, there must have been other times. Uh, but, but uh, Senator Munson, there will not come a time when I will vote for a bill that takes the safeguards that they have taken out uh, that will, that will, that will um, have the situations that we had with Roger Foley, with John Taggart, uh, these situations with, with people taking their lives rather than offering them uh, a, a, a dignity to live. I'm sorry. There will not come a time when I will um, give in to that and, and vote in favor. I don't care how often we have to send it back. There are, there are safeguards that have been taken out of this bill that are, in my opinion, and again, I respect everybody else's opinion in this chamber, but in my opinion, there have been safeguards taken out of this bill that if they are not put in, uh, we, heard, we heard safeguards from, from Senator Pate yesterday, from Senator Melville DeShane and, and, and others. And if those safeguards, if they are not in there, I will never vote for this bill. Senator Matters. Senator Platt, would you take a question? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Senator Platt, you had the opportunity and uh, were a, a very engaged senator as you participated in many meetings of the Senate Legal Committee at the pre-study that we held three weeks ago. And it was quite a powerful moment um, when you asked a panel of witnesses from the Indigenous community whether the government should, quote, hit pause on Bill C-7. And my recollection, and you briefly referenced this in your speech, was that three out of those four witnesses said, yes, hit pause. And the other witness, I think, said maybe. So this was largely due to the government's glaring lack of consultation with the Indigenous community. I'm just wondering if you could please tell us a bit more about that issue, and uh, particularly given that this is uh, such a gravely important life and death issue. Well, thank you, Senator Batters, and uh, I need to be careful here that I don't do what I did last night. Um, I don't like speaking to directly to somebody behind me without looking at them. Uh, Senator Batters, you're absolutely right. Um, and we want to talk about this bill and not about the government's general track record, but there has been a lack of consultation with indigenous communities for sure by, by this government, not just on this legislation. And not only was there a lack of consultation with the Inuit community and the Métis community, there was no consultation. And so you're absolutely right. The main focus that these four indigenous witnesses had was they were, they were uh, upset and disturbed about the lack of consultation. And I, I need to tell you the fourth witness, um, and, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, she seemed uncertain, but she was as adamant 
about the lack of consultation as the other three. And, um, and I think it's shameful when, when a large group of people like, like all the, the Inuit and all the Métis people in our country had not been consulted with at all. Senator Badr, so supplement. Thank you. Would you take another question? Yes. Thank you. Senator Platt, uh, one of the many important witnesses who participated in the legal committee pre-study was Dr. Ramo Ramona Coelho, a primary care physician to many patients with disabilities. And she noted that patients who are vulnerable may interpret a doctor raising the option of assisted suicide not so much as a choice for them, as, but as an instruction. She testified this, quote, they're hearing it as an instruction to them and not in the same shared decision-making that a well-off autonomous person might. The fragility there, the insecurity there, and then the suggestion on top can push them to confirm that, yes, my life is not worth living. It's very dangerous, quote. So, Senator Platt, I know that you um, questioned a number of witnesses about this particular issue, including, I think, Minister Qualtro, um, and that, a, that an assisted suicide request should be really patient-initiated and not uh, something to be brought up, even as an option from the medical practitioner involved. And could you please tell us why you think that that is such an important issue? Well, thank you. And indeed, um, that is one of my largest concerns is about coercion. Um, Roger Foley, um, four times, four times, he never asked for it. Four times it was suggested to him. So I think we can all put ourselves in Roger Foley's shoes, uh, and maybe we can't, but we're, we're, we're handicapped. We, we cannot help ourselves. We are dependent on others. And, and a physician who we respect is suggesting to us that maybe, you know, you are a bit of a drag on society here, and maybe society would be better off without you. You know, and we can take this into away from the disability community and into the, the, the older community. And I've shared uh, uh, my stories about my mother, 92 years old, you know, and, and she's taking up uh, a room. And, you know, if somebody would start encouraging her, you know, Mrs. Plett, you're taking up a lot of space here uh, that could be much better used by others. And I think the, the, dis, the disabled people feel exactly the same way. Uh, they, they, they need to be encouraged. They need to be encouraged and they need to be showed and they need to be built up into how much value they have. Their wisdom, their knowledge, uh, they, they, they need encouragement. And so uh, this assisted suicide should always be patient-led. It should never be suggested by anybody, nobody, whether it's a family person, whether it's a, a, a physician, it should be something that a patient uh, sincerely wants. So thank you for the question. Senator Ahmedvar. Senator Ahmedvar, you have the floor. Can you hear us, Senator Ahmed? Yep. Yes, I can. Sorry. Sorry, Speaker. I had to struggle to find my unmute button. I apologize, colleagues. Uh, will Senator Platt take a question, please? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Senator. And uh, I want to uh, concentrate on your remarks related to the two people with disabilities. And I hear what you have said, and I have read and heard the testimony of of Catherine Frazee and other people with disabilities. And I have a lot of sympathy for that position. Um, and I believe, as Senator Munson said, we should give them every opportunity to live with dignity. That's an important point. However, I would like you to uh, respond to the perspective of Nicola Gladieu, who has a disability and was one of the two who uh, were who whose case in Quebec and the decision in the Quebec, Quebec Superior Court brought us uh, to this juncture today. She stated that not all disability cases are the same. Each case must be assessed on its own merits and a blanket exclusion of people who aren't at the natural end of their lives is a violation of their charter rights. How would you respond to her? Well, Senator Ahmedvar, I, I, think, I think the first comment I would make is that uh, I might be happy that I don't have to respond to her. Um, 
and I say that very sincerely. Um, I don't know what these people are going through, Sandra Amundvar. I am inherently opposed um, to a person taking his or her own life uh, or being uh, or, or somebody helping somebody take his or her own life. That's, that's uh, in my genetics, if you will, that's in my beliefs, that's in my upbringing. Um, so I, I want you to understand I'm coming from there, but if I take that hat off, uh, then I would say that maybe there cannot be a blanket, uh, a blanket rule. But I am talking about the inherent misgivings and the, the weaknesses of this bill when people who want to live are being coerced into dying. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm quite frankly not talking in the people that are of sound mind. Uh, I'm, you know, we, we aren't there yet, but I'm, I'm not somebody that's in favor of of uh, mental, uh, mental disorder or mental illness to be the sole um, underlying factor in, in somebody asking. So if somebody is of sound mind, um, it's a separate issue, but, but clearly if, if there's not an end of life, uh, again, um, I've, I've had this particular discussion with my very good friend, uh, uh, Stephen Fletcher, who many people know, and, and, and he went through so many horrible things, and he told me about how many years he just wished he could die. And so when you talk to somebody like that personally, uh, you would make a different decision than if you talk to a Roger Foley. But this senator is why I believe we have to make a blanket decision uh, that we cannot do something. Because if we take every case individually, uh, I believe every person will have a unique case. So uh, I'm sorry, that probably doesn't answer your question, uh, Senator. But, but I really think uh, that's about as good as I'm going to do on that question. Senator Omidbar. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Senator Platt, um, in my experience, limited as it is, um, people with disabilities who have sound minds are often extremely effective advocates for themselves because they have to negotiate their daily lives in a way that you and I can't imagine uh, because we are not disabled. And I, I think that if they make their own choice on their, based on their lives and their reality, then I will say to you, who are we to stand in their way of participating in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this new uh, amended law? Well, let me, uh, let me answer, answer that with another question. Uh, if I'm just tired of living one day, should I be able to go and take a gun and shoot myself? Uh, there are many maybe that would say, yes, uh, you should be able to do that, Don. But uh, I would hope there would be more that would say no. But, but you, are, you are simply saying, who are we uh, to stand in the way of somebody asking for assisted suicide? Or who are we to stand in the way of them, them uh, committing suicide? Um, we need, to, we need to focus on our support system. First and foremost, we need to focus on our support system before we focus on ending our lives. Let's try to find ways of giving people a reason to live rather than giving re people a reason to die. Senator Coyle. The Honorable Senator Coyle. Yes, can you hear me all right? Would Senator Platt take a question? Yes. Senator Platt, thank you very much for your speech and your important contribution to our Senate debate on Bill C-7, an act to amend the criminal code, medical assistance in dying. Like the other excellent speakers we have heard to date, you've helped us in our efforts to apply sober second thought to the societally important bill. You have raised many fundamentally critical issues in your remarks, and like you, 
I'm sure we are all on high alert intellectually, ethically, morally, and spiritually as we grapple with this legislation that stretches each of us and challenges us to find the right balance between the potential benefits to Canadians and the importance of avoiding harms to Canadians, particularly our most vulnerable citizens, of this significant change to our criminal code. Senator Plett, you've spoken forcefully and thoughtfully about the potential harms of Bill C-7. Please know that I do share a number of your concerns, and in particular, I feel it is imperative to listen to the voices of members of the disabled communities, their families, and representative organizations. These organizations have asked us to ensure that our society prioritize efforts to improve opportunities for their members to enjoy a dignified life. They've also asked that they be more fulsomely consulted on Bill C-7, and in particular on the matter of safeguards. What I want to ask you, though, is about your perspective, similar to what Senator Omidvar was asking, on how to answer those vulnerable Canadians who are asking us to listen to them and respect their wishes to get final relief from their intolerable suffering and to be allowed to have access to medical assistance in dying so that they might die in dignity. What should we say to people who, like the late Audrey Parker, are dying but do not currently have the right to provide advanced consent and therefore choose, unfortunately, to die earlier than they would otherwise have out of fear of losing the capacity to consent? What should we say to disabled people? people across Canada who tell us that their suffering and condition is so severe that they want the same access to medical assistance in dying that Mr. Truchon was granted by the court in Quebec. How do we balance these questions, these requested benefits, uh, and also these calls for rights, uh, and balance those with our concerns about the potential harms that you have mentioned? This is really what we're asking uh, in this debate. And I want to know sincerely, Senator Platt, believe me, I do not personally have the answer to these questions. And I want to know what your answers might be to those. Thank you. Well, Senator Coyle, I, uh, I think the simple answer to your question is ditto. I also don't have the answers to all of that. Um, my, my main answer to that is uh, that I would rather sit at the bedside of somebody and try to give that person every reason to want to live and support that person with proper palliative care. Uh, but we are, we are basically uh, saying, our government is saying, that rather than putting extra money into palliative care, let's rather find a way of, of allowing people uh, to hasten to hasten their death. Um, you know, Senator Coyle, when, when, when we take situations like uh, Sean Taggart, uh, when we take situations, um, uh, and, and I'll speak of a very personal, very personal one in my community in, 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 in Landmark, a person, a young lady related to me, uh, died and, and the last weeks of her life she could move her eyelids. That was all she could move. But until the very end, when she could still communicate, she had her family there, uh, they assisted her, she got all the care she, she needed, and she wanted to live. She wanted to have her children beside her until she naturally died. So we have different situations. How can I answer a question when it hasn't, when it hasn't hit me personally? I can give you that example as somebody who wanted to live. Um, and until we exhaust every avenue of, of trying to improve people's lives, um, I, I don't think we should try to find ways of, of hastening um, ending people's lives. Senator Atulajan. Senator Plett, will you take a question? Certainly, Senator. Senator Plett, um, I was asked yesterday uh, 
how many racialized groups have been consulted and how many faith groups have been consulted? And I, I didn't have an answer. Maybe this is a question I should have put to uh, the government leader in the Senate. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if you know, if you do have an answer for me. None that I'm aware of. Well, unfortunately, uh, Senator Tulajan, uh, I am not aware of any racialized groups and or faith groups that have been consulted. Um, we have heard time and again, the government has done extensive con consultation, yet we heard from witnesses at committee uh, that either the consultation was inadequate or there was none. I do know, as I said earlier, no Métis or Inuit uh, groups were consulted. Uh, there was very, very little consultation done with the Indigenous communities. Uh, with respect to faith groups, we heard from a number of organiza organizations, including the Canadian Association of Immense, the United Church, the Catholic Bishops Association, and these are just to name a few. Um, all of the faith groups were opposed to the new proposals in this bill, um, but they, they weren't consulted. And, and so I am not aware of any racialized groups, and, and without question, um, Senator Atulajan, um, you know, the government had, uh, and, and, and I, you know, I don't know that I want to flog this horse to death, but they, they had all kinds of time. They had 16 months. Yes, they had an election, but then they prorogued Parliament. And, and, and then even after that, it took them two months. This bill is numbered C7. Why isn't it numbered C2? Why didn't they move it along earlier? But it's, it's, it's Bill C7. They, they dealt with all kinds of other legislation that we haven't received here. But at the end, they needed to rush this through. You know, Senator, we you, I, and everybody in this chamber have been part of approving hundreds of billions of dollars worth of money during a pandemic that the government would, would, would not get done properly and then they would rush it into our chamber and we would have a day to, to approve this and if we didn't then they would let every Canadian in the country know that, that we didn't want to help them. That's the way they treated this bill. That's the way they treated this bill, but Senator, I think they're going to find out that, that maybe this is a bill, uh, Senator Munson asked, what do we do? This is a bill where we can truly, truly, I think, uh, show Canada what a Senate should do when, when there isn't proper consultation and when they move something through and want us to, to, to pass it in a hurry. I don't think we should be we should be moved and maybe we should find a, a way of consulting with these, these groups. But there hasn't been enough done. Senator Atulajan. Senator Plett, thank you for that uh, answer. Um, I asked because as a Muslim, I uh, bear the responsibility of 1.5, maybe 1.6 million Muslims, and they will be questioning me. Um, so I guess I don't have an answer for them. And if they d did consult one, one imam for 1.5 or 1.6 million people, that, that is not enough. But my next question to you would be the question that I asked Senator Gold yesterday is that the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities warned, and this was earlier this year, that if assisted dying is made available for persons with health conditions or impairments, but who are not terminally ill, a social assumption could be made that it is better to be dead than to live with a disability. So Senator Platt, is there any way that we can ensure that those who choose made are not making that choice because of social stigma, isolation, or lack of access to personal assistance or disability-related services? Well, first let me, um, when you ask, I don't know what I will tell the people that I am representing, I think you can tell um, your community, the Muslim community, the Yemens, that um, uh, they haven't been singled, singled out here for sure. They're not, they're not being picked on. Uh, typically, they haven't, they haven't consulted with anybody. So um, you're, you're certainly part of, of, of the larger group. Uh, listen, Senator Tulajan. Um, I think the second question goes to really what I have been saying all along. We need to find a way of, of making a person 
uh, that is that is ill, that that is handicapped, that cannot contribute to society as much as he or she feels that they should, we need to find a way of making them believe that they are contributing to society. The fact that they can't move their arms or can't move their legs, uh, they are contributing to society. And, and as long as we're going to try to find a way of letting them die with dignity as opposed to letting them live with dignity, uh, then that will be the first thing that we're going to do because isn't that the easiest thing? And so if we want to take the easy way out, we want to take the easy way out, Senator, then we pass this bill. But if we want to do the hard thing and the right thing, we either amend this bill or we reject this bill. Senator Bowling. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, Senator Platt, will you take another question? Certainly. Um, I really appreciate uh, what you said. In fact, I want to commend everybody who's spoken on this bill. I have found it uh, uh, very, um, I found the debate, level of debate, excellent. And uh, uh, really appreciate the, um, the honesty and the concerns that are coming forward. And um, if I may, I am one who has dealt with um, issues of palliative care in its various stages. And uh, every step of those stages, I have to say, they're very tough decisions. And uh, Senator Platt, I agree with you about living with dignity. And I also agree with dying with dignity. And um, I think these difficult decisions uh, in looking at this, we have to face from 360 degrees and some of the differing um, perspectives that uh, we bring forward raise conflicting issues. I want to, um, if I may, ask you about a letter I received from a friend. Um, and uh, we've had a subsequent conversation. And her husband died peacefully uh, with assisted dying in his own home with his wife at his side on October 26th. Uh, he was a lawyer, very sharp. Uh, he'd had a 10-year challenge with bone cancer and through that was able to make a, a, had a quality of life. However, earlier this fall, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and that's when he made the decision to, to end his life. And he was determined to die with dignity as he had lived with dignity. Um, a question they faced, and we had a long discussion about this last night, was the 10-day wait period in the, in the current piece of legislation. And for him, that was really difficult because his medical situation had him, his situation, just his, his quality of life de and decreasing and pain going up. And he, in the end, stopped taking um, morphine so he could make sure he was of sound mind on that day 10 to enact the decision that he had made. I know some people are saying 10 days is too long. Other people are saying it's not long enough. Um, and I know this is changing your discussion a little bit, Senator Platt, but I would really value your thought on that situation of an articulate, accomplished um, uh, Canadian citizen who had thoughtfully and carefully made up his mind. And his wife said to me, and I quote, as a surviving spouse of 40 years, the fact that I was able to share this journey with him in our home and know with such certainty that he accomplished his goal to die a dignified death has contributed enormously to my own healing. And I know what those healing situations are like. So I just, I just, I would value your thought about the 10 day waiting period in the current legislation and the proposed change in this legislation. Thank you, Senator Bovey. Um, I want to assure uh, you, Senator Bovey, that I believe in trying to make sure people can die with dignity. It's the hastening of that that I don't support. I sat beside, uh, I, I, I wasn't beside my mother-in-law's bed. We were there minutes after. Um, I sat beside my father-in-law when he took his last breath. I sat beside my own father when he took his last breath. They both died with dignity. They did not ask for any help. They um, received morphine right until the end. Uh, but they died with dignity. So 
Um, I think you don't need to hasten your death to die with dignity. Uh, and as far as the situation you're concerning about, uh, the individual you're talking about, uh, it was fortunate that he was of sound mind to the end. But many people, many people uh, aren't that clear of mind. And when we don't have a reflection period and somebody that is in extreme pain uh, makes a decision and they don't have a reflection period, um, I shared the story of the, the, the lady in, in the Netherlands that, that made some significant moves at the end when they wanted to give her the substance that would then ultimately take her life. Um, if there isn't a proper reflection period, people can change, can change their minds um, and not do this. And I certainly don't, don't know the case of the individual you're talking about, Senator Bovey, and, and so I certainly don't want to in any way judge uh, the decision he made or, or, or whether um, if the reflection period hadn't been there, whether he would have made a different decision. But, but I think um, I think the 10 day or the 14 day uh, reflection period is a safeguard that absolutely has to stay there. I, I would even wish that it was a longer reflection period. People have bad days, they have bad weeks, um, and then they actually sometimes uh, rebound a bit and they have some, some, some good weeks. So um, I'm concerned about every safeguard that is removed because those safeguards were there for a specific reason. And um, uh, this is why I asked yesterday after Senator Batters had spoken, I asked her about the slippery slope scenario. And I think every move we make um, is a slippery slope. We are getting one step, one step further. And so um, I, I guess my personal preference is, Senator Bovey, that we certainly at least keep that in or even extend that. May I have a supplementary, please, uh, Your Honour? You may, Senator Bowie. Thank you. Um, Senator Platt, I'm not sure whether this, this last little bit of mine is a question or just, just putting something on the floor. Um, uh, uh, this widow uh, also said to me, my husband was very focused on the quality, not length of life. That quality could be defined by him and him alone. And if he had taken morphine that he needed for the pain in those last few days, she and he knew he wouldn't be of sound mind on day 10 when he, when, when he made the final decision. So he did not take the morphine. And her lines were, and I'd like your thoughts on this, um, I can say unequivocally that there are so many checks and balances in the process that these last hurdles that still exist and will be addressed by the amendments are unnecessary and cruel. So how do we find the balance, Senator Platt, between giving people the time they need, and you're quite right, people have their down days and their up days, and dealing with the, what's unnecessary and cruel? How, how, how do... How, would you recommend we define that balance as we look at this legislation? I guess I can only answer that, uh, in my opinion, trying to keep a person alive isn't cruel. I think it's helpful, and that's what we should do. 